Good morning. Welcome, everybody. I hope that um, whether you're joining this uh, right now, live, or whether you're tuning in on the uh, catch up or watching it on our YouTube channel or wherever it is, I hope you are going to find this uh, a blessing as we meet and gather together uh, today. So, as we begin to uh, Get people tuning in. I'll say good morning to you. Morning, Roland and family. Morning to the Huss family. Morning, all. Margaret's there. Good to see you. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're managing to get uh, tuned in. Hello, Kathleen. Adrian and Norma and all those who are with you. It's very encouraging always to see you uh, joining in with us here. Indeed, it is a beautiful day. I hope it's nice down in Ballantra as well. And in Lahi, Sherry, Harold. Hello, Drumrusk. Hello, boys. Good morning, Drum Stevlin. Morning, and Gordlowski, and everywhere that you are. Uh, great to see you. The sun is shining outside, and uh, I want to congratulate you. You are the ones who put your clocks forward. You've remembered. Full marks to you, 100%. You are tuned in there. And in St. Joseph's Avenue, what time is it in that time zone there? Deborah, hello and Dorothy and Howard and everybody. I won't be able to name all the names because they're coming in thick and fast now, but really, really good to see you. Down in County Cavan, we're all getting plugged in now. That's wonderful. So uh, a warm, warm welcome to everybody as you are um, tuning in and joining us today. So this is just great. And uh, we're delighted. Paul and Derry, hello. Uh, morning, Albert. Yes, it's good to see you indeed. Okay, and hello there, Amanda and Joy. Okay, well, um, we're coming up close to 11 o'clock now. I hope it's 11 o'clock where you are. It certainly is just about 11 o'clock here at the rectory up at the Glebe, and uh, the sun is shining, and we're going to get together to worship God. Uh, yes, I have had my hair cut, by the way, and uh, thank you very much. Yes, I'm very pleased with it too. I went to a very exclusive a uh, hairdresser and um, the result is as you see it. So thank you all. Um, morning, morning. So what we're going to do is, uh, as usual, as we tune in this morning, we're going to take some time to do what we would do if we were meeting together in church, whether it was in Donegal, Lahi, Kilimar, Lahesk, or some other place that you would be, we would be very simply doing a couple of things. We'd be lifting up our voices to God in praise. We would be uh, bringing our prayers to the Lord. We would be uh, obviously listening to his word and we would be uh, enjoying fellowship together. And the last one of those is a wee bit more difficult, although please keep the likes and the comments coming in and show us that you're there. And that way we will be able to be encouraged by that sense that uh, we're together in this time. But also uh, the other things we can equally do. We can still sing our praises to him. We can still uh, lift up our voices in prayer and we can still hear from his word together in the Bible. So we're going to do all of those things uh, this morning. That is the plan. Uh, by God's help, we're going to spend a good time in uh, praise and worship this today as we begin. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent, so Easter Day is a fortnight away from now, and uh, a very significant fortnight for us in uh, wherever we are, and here in Donegal and across the Repub Republic, we have two weeks where we have uh, even tighter restrictions on us than we have had up to this point, and so um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we keep up with those, that we comply with those regulations and restrictions. And um, 
by God's grace, we will together do all we can to defeat this, uh, this virus together. But also, of course, we're going to use the power of prayer and that'll be a big feature of today. Now, I think um, we have enough people gathered together that we should get uh, on and get started. So I greet you as we always do. The Lord be with you. And as we begin, I'm going to use a uh, hymn, and it's going to be hymn number 92 from our hymn book. It's How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. It's a lovely hymn written by John Newton. He was the same man who wrote Amazing Grace. And he was someone who just had such a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, coming really from the fact that he had uh, been a, a sinner. He'd been a, a slave trader. He lived in the 18th century. He had been a, a really vile person. And then, of course, he came to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved by him and grew uh, in, in to become a, a preacher. He was a, an ordained minister in the Church of England. And John Newton wrote many, many hundreds of hymns. The most famous is Amazing Grace. And perhaps the second is How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our fear. It makes the wounded spirit whole and calms the troubled breast. Tis manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest. Dear name, the rock on which I build my shield and hiding place, my never-failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. Jesus, my Saviour, Shepherd, Friend, my Prophet, Priest, and King, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Weak is the effort of my heart, and cold my warmest thought. But when I see thee as thou art, I'll praise thee as I ought. Till then I would thy love proclaim with every fleeting breath. And may the music of thy name refresh my soul in death. Amen. How wonderful it is to think about Jesus and whatever darkness there may be in the world around us when we come into the light of Christ. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. How beautiful and how glorious he is and how we want to express our love to him. Let's not be ashamed to say that we love Jesus and that he is our Lord and that he is our only hope uh, in these days and in all days. We have had some beautiful hymns recorded for us by Naomi and Zara Montgomery, which we have been putting up on the Facebook page. I haven't yet worked out how I can incorporate them into the middle of our live broadcast. If anybody's clever enough to tell me how to do that, then do. But please do go and watch those and enjoy continuing in worship uh, led by their lovely voices. Let's turn to confession of our sins and I'm going to introduce this by reading from the psalm for today which is Psalm 130 and uh, here's what it says, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. 
Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. In his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Wonderful to think of those words, with you there is forgiveness. With you there is forgiveness. And that is why we very often in our services turn to the Lord to join together in a prayer of confession. And I'm going to lead that prayer and We might just like to take a moment to reflect on any ways in which we have not lived up to our Christian calling and we have uh, let the Lord down and we'll seek his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful thing it is to be forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ through his blood shed on the cross. And let's um, move on now as we move towards our... um, Bible uh, reading and Bible teaching. And before we come to the main reading for today, which by the way is John chapter 11, and if you have a Bible, you might like to grab that and you can look at it. But a quick little quiz. So, young people particularly, get tuned in at this moment, okay? A quiz coming up. Um, It's about numbers in the Bible, okay? First of all, how many books are there in the Bible? How many books in the Bible? If you think you know the answer, you can even type it in in a comment. We know that the Bible is a long book. We know it has about a thousand or so pages. We know that uh, it's divided up into different books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. How many books are there in the Bible? Oh dear, no comments coming in at all yet. This is, this is serious. I thought you guys would have known this one. An easy one. How many books in the Bible? We know there's two testaments, the old and the new. We know that uh, there's one one answer coming in there. Wonder is that right? Mm-hmm. Books of the Bible. So there are there are very very many. The answer is we've got a couple of people answering. I'll give you another ten seconds to tell me how many there are. You've had time even to count them by now. It's not you don't even have to know it. You could have gone away and looked at the contents page. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In the Bible, there are 66 books. Okay, it has 66 books. Uh, more tr- well done, well done. More tricky one. How many chapters do you think there are? Don't uh, don't worry about commenting on that one unless you want to very quickly. But I think I'll put up the answer. In the Bible, there are. 1,189 chapters. So that's a lot of Bible, isn't it? You need to, well done, all the 66 is coming in now. The um, Very good. So you have um, a lot of chapters in the good book. And of course, every chapter is divided into verses. How on earth many verses do you think there are? How many verses in the whole Bible? There are 31,102. Well, give or take. It depends slightly how you count. But um, 31,102 verses. That is a lot. But here's the real point of where I'm going. 
Do you know what uh, is the shortest verse in the Bible? What is the shortest verse in the Bible? Well, there are a number of very short ones. There are a number of verses that only have two words in them. Um, here's one contender for shortest verse in the Bible. It's from Job chapter 3 and verse 2. He said, it only has those two words, he said. But that's a wee bit of a cheating one because in the original Hebrew language, it actually had more uh, words than that. It actually says, uh, and Job replied and said. So in the English Bible, they've streamlined it a wee bit to he said. Uh, here's a lovely verse, which is only two words. Rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16. That's a great one to remember. A lovely two-word verse. Rejoice always. And actually, there's another one right next to it, which is pray continually. So there's two great verses to remember that have only two words. But probably the one that you guessed, the most famous, very short verse in the Bible, and it is, oh, somebody got it there, well done. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. John 11, verse 35. Very, very famous uh, verse, perhaps because of being so short. I remember learning that in Sunday school about the shortest verse of the Bible, and yet a verse not to be neglected because it is teaching us something really important about the fact that Jesus cares for us and the fact that he loves us so much that when we are in trouble and difficulty, he is right there with us to join with us uh, in our sorrow and in our struggle. So out of all of the 31,000 verses in the Bible, the verse I want you above all to remember today is this one here. Well done, everybody coming in with those good answers. So let's read the place in the Bible where that comes, which is John chapter 11, okay? And uh, John chapter 11, and I'm going to begin at verse 1. So this is uh, the account of Jesus and Mary and Martha and Lazarus, okay? Now, a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay ill, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, 
I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, she was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to say a few words about that passage, if you'll allow me today. And particularly, I want to say three things. Jesus cares, Jesus calls, and Jesus conquers. So that's the, the three things. First of all, Jesus cares. One of the things we see very, very clearly in this lovely passage is that Jesus is full of loving care and compassion for his friends when they're in distress. You see that in so many places in this Bible passage. You see it in the early verses where they call Lazarus the one Jesus loves. He was famous for his love. We see in verse 5 that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then when the bystanders see Jesus weeping in verse 36, they say amongst themselves, see how he loved him. But of course, the simplest indication of all of Jesus' care is in that shortest verse of the Bible. Jesus wept. In their distress, he weeps with them. In our distress, he weeps with us. We know how difficult it is at the minute with everything which is going on and all that we're not able to do. And we know that across our country and indeed across the world, there's a great deal of distress and heartache caused by the present situation with this virus. And people are losing their lives and people are losing their loved ones and people are worried and concerned. And there are, there are tears, there's weeping. Jesus weeps with us. That's the first thing we need to know from this passage. Jesus cares. He's with us in our trouble, in our sorrow, in our distress. He's not a God who's just distant, far away in heaven, uh, enjoying an easy life while we are struggling down here. He weeps with us. And yet that raises a question as well, doesn't it? Because um, we wonder then, if he cares, then why does he allow these things to take place? You see that actually happening right here in the passage, because uh, even as the Jewish people around Mary and Martha were noticing how Jesus was weeping, 
Some of them were also asking, couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Mary and Martha themselves said to Jesus, if only you had been here, this would not have happened. Our brother would not have died. And that's something that we often find as well, isn't it? That we're saying, if only Jesus would come and he would do something and he would stop this. And we say, couldn't he who did these wonderful miracles in the past, couldn't he do something now to save us and to rescue us in our distress? So one of the things that comes across clearly in this passage is that Jesus has his reasons for ordering things the way he does. There are things which happen that we don't always understand. And very often the timing of things is not as we would have chosen, but it is as he has chosen it in his goodness and love and care. Often he'll have reasons for things that we do not see and understand. You find that right here in this passage. Do you remember how when Jesus was at the beginning of the passage um, uh, uh, and uh, they sent word to him that, uh, that Lazarus was ill and he held back. He stayed for two days before he got up and made the journey to Bethany to be with them. And uh, he says to the disciples that what's going to happen is going to be for God's glory. In other words, there was a plan in his waiting and not going immediately to Lazarus and healing him from his sickness. There was a plan in his delay and allowing things to get worse before they got better. He allows his disciples and Mary and Martha to pass through this painful experience in order that some greater good would come about through it. That's a very important principle, isn't it? And sometimes we have to pass through pain uh, in order for something better to happen through it. I always think of the time when I took uh, one of our boys for his vaccinations when he was a little baby. I won't name which one, uh, but as a very small baby, he had to be taken to get his jab for polio or measles or whatever it was. And um, when the needle went in, he cried. And he turned around and looked at me with a terrible look as if I had betrayed him and let him down as his dad. And yet, of course, it was out of, his, out of love that we were giving him that injection to spare him from worse harm if he had become ill from one of those diseases. Sometimes God allows us to go through difficulties and pain in order to bring about some greater good. I wonder, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is in control it's hard to understand, isn't it? It's hard to see why does he allow these things to happen if he cares about us. And yet we must trust him that he is bringing about some greater good through it. For God, there is never a case that things happen due to circumstances beyond his control. We sometimes say that, don't we? But it's never true for God. All things are in his control and he is bringing about good. I don't know why this present crisis is happening. I don't think it's even safe to speculate why it's happening, but God will be using it for good. Jesus cares. That's our first point from this passage. And then secondly, Jesus calls. This is really important. At the heart of our passage, we find Jesus making this call, this invitation. He says in these two verses to Martha, verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus is issuing a call to faith in this passage to Martha, Mary, the crowds around the tomb, and to all of us. I wonder if you notice how many times faith and belief are mentioned. Perhaps if you look back through the passage later on, John 11, you'll see how many times it comes up. Uh, he says there, for example, in verse 40, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. It's a summons to faith. In the middle of this passage, he is calling us to reach out to him and to receive his blessings through faith. I remember one time when I was a young boy going for a walk up in the mountains of Morn, County Down, uh, near where we lived. And uh, I wonder if mommy and daddy are watching this, maybe they'll remember this particular walk because I fell down a hole 
uh, I fell into a kind of a bog hole and um, there I was um, up to the waist in water and the sky high up above me around the rim of this hole I couldn't see out and I was uh, having a bit of a panic and then over the top of the, uh, the, the hole there appeared my father and he reached down his hand and what did I have to do in that moment? I had to reach out, grab his hand and be lifted out. Uh, it reminds me of that psalm which says he lifted me out of the, the clay and the muck and the mire. So what is Jesus calling us to do at this moment of difficulty and indeed at any, every stage in our lives? He's calling us to reach out and to take hold of his hand. Jesus is calling us to faith. He's calling us to receive him and all the blessings that he brings. In that passage, John 11, it says, whoever believes will live even though they die. Jesus is calling us to believe, to faith, to be rescued by him. There is a lot of fear around at the minute, isn't there? There's a lot of worry and it's very natural and understandable because we're in worrying times. And yet, even our greatest fear, the fear of death, is something which Jesus Christ has a remedy for. He says, whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever believes in me will never die because I am the resurrection and the life. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you taken his hand? Have you responded to his offer of life? If not, or if you're not sure, here's how you can do it. Simply by saying to him, sorry, thank you, please. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Thank you that you died for me and rose again. Please forgive me. Give me new life by the Holy Spirit. It's very simple, isn't it? Anybody could do that. You could do it in prayer right now. You could do it at the end of this little broadcast. You could say to the Lord Jesus Christ, sorry, thank you, please. Invite him into your life and receive that wonderful gift that he offers of life everlasting. I know there's many people watching here uh, who have done that and you've given your life to Jesus and you're walking with him and that's wonderful and uh, he, has, he has you in his hand. But if you're not sure or if you've not done that yet, then today is the day because you can live without fear of death. You can live without uh, being separated from, from God because of your sins. You can live with him forever. If you do decide to take that step and to, uh, to, to, to respond to Jesus in faith and to give your life to him, then please send me a message to tell me that you've done that. And I would like to encourage you and to um, even a private message uh, if you prefer to do it that way or send me a text. And I would love to help you and respond to you. Jesus cares. We've seen that first. He weeps. Jesus calls. He invites us to come to him in faith. And then thirdly, I want to finish with this last point. Jesus conquers, conquers. That is, he is victorious. Jesus wins. Because in our Bible passage, John 11, we have this incredibly dramatic moment where Jesus stands at the tomb and says, Lazarus, come out. It would be a brave person that would do that, wouldn't it? With a grieving family all around them to stand at the graveside and say, Lazarus, come out. It's not for us. Uh, in general, to do that. But it is what Jesus did. And he says, come out. And Lazarus comes out of the grave alive. How we would love him to do that, wouldn't we, for our relatives? How we miss those who died and we would love for them to be restored back to us and even in his own life and ministry, Jesus only raised a very small handful of people from the dead. Uh, only two or three or four, I think. And he did it to demonstrate that he has power over death and that he has conquered death. He did it to show that he has the victory over this great enemy of death. The raising of Lazarus points forward to a greater resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus himself. Greater because he didn't need anyone to stand at the graveside and call him out. He didn't need, he didn't come out of the grave stumbling and still tied up in those grave clothes. He left them behind, folded neatly in the tomb. 
He rose never to die again. Poor Lazarus had to die a second time in the end. Jesus is alive forevermore. He didn't just come back from death. He went through death. He's conquered. A lovely illustration I like comes from the old preacher Charles Simeon from the uh, 18th century. And Simeon uh, used to say, when you're trying to crawl through a hedge, uh, it's hard work. You're scrambling through a hedge between one field and another. But once you've got your head and your shoulders through, you're fairly sure the rest of the body will be able to follow. There'll be some scratches, but you will get through. Jesus, our head, has gone through death. And if we are members of his body, then we will get through it too. Although there may be some scratches and pain along the way. But when we come to Jesus and come and be part of his body, part of him, united with him through faith, then we can pass through death to life. The last verse of our passage says, Many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and saw what Jesus did, believed in him. May that be true today. May many of us who are listening this morning believe in Jesus and so have firm confidence in the face of all trouble and even of death. Amen. I'm going to take just a moment uh, uh, to reflect and then I'm going to uh, do a hymn for you. Well, it's tempting to do thine be the glory, but we're going to save that for Easter Day in a fortnight's time. And we're going to do to God be the glory, great things he has done. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our rapture, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, 
great things he has done. Well, good news indeed. Let's uh, turn to prayer now in a moment. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to say the Apostles' Creed as we affirm our faith, and then we're going to turn to our prayers together. So first, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let's turn now to prayer. First of all, I'm going to use a prayer for this, um, this Sunday, the fifth Sunday in Lent, also known as Passion Sunday. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I call it for the morning time. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take a moment as we pray together and I'll just mention a few things to pray for and I'll leave gaps so that you can perhaps just pray in the quietness of your own uh, hearts. First of all, we want to pray for all who are ill at this time in whatever way, including those ill from the COVID-19 virus. We pray for those who are currently in hospital or nursing homes. We pray for those who are lonely, anxious or afraid. We pray for those who have no homes of their own. We pray for those who are working hard to keep us safe and to treat illnesses. Staff in our hospitals and other medical facilities. The emergency services. Those bringing food and supplies to loved ones. those who are caring for the young or for the old. For those whose work is hidden and yet still vital. For those whose home is not a happy or safe place to be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And I'm going to use a prayer which I mentioned on Friday evening, uh, or afternoon rather. It's a prayer for use in time of plague or sickness. And its words are old in their form, but they're very meaningful. O Almighty God, the Lord of life and death, of health and sickness, have pity upon us, miserable sinners, now visited with great sickness and mortality. Withdraw from us this grievous affliction. Sanctify to us, we beseech thee, this thy fatherly correction. Enlarge our charity to relieve those who need our help. Bless the remedies applied to assist them. 
Give us prudence to see and vigor to use those means which thy providence affords for preventing and alleviating such calamities. And above all, teach us to know how frail and uncertain our condition is, and so to number our days that we may seriously apply our hearts to that holy and heavenly wisdom whilst we live here, which may in the end bring us to life everlasting. Through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thine only Son, our Lord. Amen. And let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, before I give the blessing and let you go, um, sorry, we've been a bit longer today. We're getting towards the 45 there, but you're still with me. So well done, everybody. Uh, just a word or two or an announcement or two. Um, the fact that uh, please continue to do all the things that you need to be doing within the limits that are around us. So remember, we are very restricted now in terms of going out of the house. So follow those instructions and obey them. They're for all of our good and stay home. Uh, but if you possibly can, get out into the fresh air and let the sun shine on your face for a little while. Uh, and you can go for a walk uh, briefly uh, within close range of your home. Um, please remember to keep in touch with vulnerable people. Please, why don't you spend a couple of minutes this afternoon and just think through all your friends and the people in our parishes and um, think to yourself, who is there that might be uh, kind of, who is there that might be missed? Who is there that might be on their own and they might be in bother and they could just do with a phone call and encouragement and help. So please be sure to do that. Hello everyone who's joining us. There we are. We've got uh, Bishop Ken Good and Mary. How wonderful. Good morning, Bishop Ken and Mary. Good to have you with us, uh, uh, joining us right here and now in this way. Well, so please think about the vulnerable and those who are alone and please a phone call or a text would be a wonderful idea of a way to encourage them. Uh, remember our Facebook page and uh, we have some videos up there including Zara and Naomi singing some hymns beautifully. As I mentioned, I haven't yet figured out how to incorporate those into our morning service, but I would really encourage you to go and listen to the ones that are up there already in Christ alone and how great thou art. And there are a few more which will be going up over the next few days. And so we're just delighted to have that, uh, that help. Speaking of bishops, our present bishop, Bishop Andrew, uh, is doing an online broadcast at 4 p.m. So you can go over to Derry and Raffo. Uh, website or Facebook page and the, the bishop will have a message there and uh, he's much better looking and much briefer than me so uh, do tune in at 4 p.m. and you will uh, enjoy that uh, as, as our, our, um, our leader so to speak spiritually gives us his guidance and wisdom. Uh, we're going to have a broadcast at 8 p.m. on Wednesday God willing uh, with more of the same and then we have a brief prayer time on Friday at 1 p.m. Brief prayer time Friday at 1 p.m. So we look forward to that as well. Um, I feel like there was something else I was going to say but it's escaped me so we'll leave it at that. But let's just recap very briefly what we looked at this morning in John chapter 11. We saw that Jesus cares. He weeps with those who weep. Don't ever feel that you're on your own if you're a friend of Jesus because he weeps with you. Second, we saw that Jesus calls. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. So be sure, make sure that indeed you have believed in Jesus and received him and that you're walking with him. And then we saw that Jesus conquers. He has the victory over death. Lazarus, come out. And one day, we too will join him in eternal life. So now may the Lord himself bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and bring you peace. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace and we'll meet again soon like this.